Okay, looks like everyone is in. We're going to go ahead and get started with uh, tonight's session. Thanks for your uh, patience and thanks for joining us tonight on a uh, what should be a very interesting discussion on competitive contact. Um, my name is Matt Leaf. I'm the director of the officiating program, and I'll be the uh, the host of the moderator for tonight's session. Uh, and very much looking forward to uh, spending some time here with our two uh, panelists. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Heather Mannix who is our ADM Regional uh, Manager for Female Hockey. Uh, Heather joined USA Hockey in the ADM program uh, in November of 2019. Uh, she has a, a master's degree in exercise science from uh, George Washington University. And uh, most recently and interestingly, spent six years uh, doing some very extensive research on uh, youth sports and, and what it is that makes that fun. Uh, for the youth participants and the youth athletes and stuff like that. So, um, Heather, thanks for joining us and uh, very much look forward to, uh, to hearing your thoughts tonight. Uh, our other panelist is a gentleman by the name of Roger Grillo. He is our ADM regional manager in the Northeast. Um, he has uh, um, basically started with USA Hockey in, in 2009 when the ADM program got started. Uh, prior to that, he was a uh, uh, a college player at the University of Maine, where he was a 10th round draft pick in the 1983 NHL draft by the Vancouver Canucks, um, and uh, went on into the coaching career at a pretty young age, uh, spent several seasons as an assistant at Vermont University, uh, and then most recently was, uh, prior to USA Hockey, was the head coach at Brown University from 1997 to 2009. So uh, we're bringing a wealth of experience from the player and from the coaching side. Um, and from the, uh, um, the, the long-term athlete development side tonight. So I think it's going to be an interesting uh, perspective uh, that they can provide to us uh, on, the, uh, on the world of competitive contact and body checking. Um, as we usually do, just a reminder, if you do have any questions that pop up throughout the session, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A uh, function. Uh, I'll be monitoring that throughout the night, and, and we'll try to uh, answer as many of those as we can. And uh, before we get going here, we're going to get into our standard uh, uh, poll and uh, want to get a little bit of feedback and a little bit of information from our audience here tonight. So uh, real quick, three questions tonight. Uh, if you could just take a look at it and uh, go through each question and, and give us your best, uh, best possible answer. Uh, at the end of the three questions, you'll get a chance to submit, and that'll give us some valuable feedback in terms of... Uh, um, what, uh, what our audience is like tonight. Okay, let's uh, take a look at our results real quick. Uh, question number one, what percentage of your games that you work are competitive contact or AKA the body contact category? Uh, looks like we're pretty much uh, evenly split um, with uh, uh, about 33% doing a majority of their games uh, under the competitive contact rules and uh, uh, the rest uh, being a little bit less than that. So a, a pretty wide, uh, pretty wide range of experience there. Uh, question number two, are officiating program educational materials helpful determining the difference between competitive contact versus body checking? Um, again, pretty evenly split, 44% say that uh, it's very helpful and 52% somewhat helpful. Uh, encourage that uh, there only seems to be one official or one group out there right now that's still uh, maybe a little bit confused, and hopefully we're going to solve, uh, solve part of that uh, tonight for you. Uh, and then the third and final question, uh, are coaches, players, and parents fully knowledgeable of the difference between competitive contact and body checking in your local area? Um, and again, uh, I think uh, pretty evenly split there. It looks like 20% uh, or so uh, think that they have a pretty good understanding, uh, and then uh, there's, there's roughly 40% each either have a, a little understanding or, or really a kind of sort of struggling with it and, and can't really distinguish the difference. Um, and uh, I think if we just put that in perspective, that's the officiating uh, perspective. And, and considering that probably every time they blow the whistle, 50% of the people don't agree with them, uh, that probably makes a little bit of sense. So again, thank you for that feedback that is uh, helpful for us uh, in understanding uh, uh, our audience a little bit, and, and hopefully we can uh, uh, we can gear our presentation tonight towards uh, towards uh, that uh, that concept, so to speak. Uh, Want to share my screen real quick here. Um, get started with a uh, 
uh, presentation. Um, and then uh, we'll get our panelists involved here. So bear with me. Okay, so just uh, want to just start out real history before we get uh, Roger and, and uh, uh, Heather involved here tonight. Um, when when uh, we had a group or a subcommittee that uh, that was charged with creating the Declaration of Player Safety, uh, a big part of that discussion was uh, we wanted to try to minimize the confusion between body contact and body checking, uh, and the fact that uh, the word body is used in both of that sometimes creates some of that confusion. Um, and at the same time, uh, it's important from the player development and the, the progression to teaching body checking, as you'll hear from our experts tonight, um, that we wanted to place a greater emphasis on the legal physical play um, that we encourage, meaning USA Hockey at all levels of play, um, and basically becomes the foundation for the successful uh, body checking. So what we've done is, is basically uh, as part of this rule change process and what was implemented with the declaration is we've changed uh, the term body contact and, and changed that to competitive contact. Um, and you'll see here uh, on the screen that I won't read the whole thing is, is um, the definition that will be appearing in the glossary um, that uh, started with the declaration of player safety, but now it's going to be added into the glossary and into rule 604 um, to hopefully create a little bit of a better understanding. So um, I, I guess I want to start with Roger tonight. Um, you've been out in the grassroots world now for a little over 10 years. Um, and a lot of the debunking that you've had to do, uh, especially at the lower levels, is that no check means no contact. Um, and, it, and it's not real hockey. And, and there's some people out there that, that feel that, you know, we should be checking at all levels. Um, how is this changing the approach uh, by using the term competitive contact going to make that process a little bit easier uh, for for you as an ADM regional manager and also our CEP instructors um, as they more clearly emphasize the skill progression uh, needed to teach proper body checking? Yeah, I think, Matt, that's a great question. I think it's one of the biggest challenges we have right now. I think what we've learned over the last number of years is, is the the – teaching body contact and the components that go in the body contact and then eventually into full body checking is an area where I think a lot of our coaches aren't really super comfortable. Um, and, and a part of the reason why we, we, we've kind of discouraged the um, implementation of full body checking at a young age. I mean, I think back to when, when I started playing hockey, it was, there was, it was supposedly checking at all ages, but I don't, I don't ever remember getting checked when I was a young kid. So uh, I don't think it was, it was just a different mindset back then, but um, it's part of the reason why we really pushed hard uh, for cross ice hockey at, at the younger ages so that there is more bumping. There's, we, we call it kind of bumping and battling. It's kind of goes back to like soccer and basketball, like learning how to win space, learning how to use your body to win space, to win possession without, fully blowing somebody up it's 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 to gain possession the, the, the game's changed so much that possession of the puck is such a critical component and, and how do you possess the puck by using your your body and, and winning position and and and, and space uh, and i think that's that's a big part of what we're trying to do with this separation of the definitions but also the progression that's supposed to happen from youngest kids all the way up through our older kids yeah, thanks. Thanks, Roger. And, and I guess, Heather, my question for you, uh, moving on here a little bit, is, is there seems to be a common misconception uh, within the officiating ranks that, uh, um, that the officials, or I should say that the coaching at the younger levels, uh, don't do a real great job in terms of teaching that, that body checking progression um, and that, that skill progression that's necessary to get the body checking. I know that you're actively involved with um, you know, a, a committee working with the coaching or the CEP program on, on curriculum and those types of things dealing with this. Uh, what are some of the resources that uh, the coaching education program uh, is incorporating into their curriculum to emphasize the importance of coaches to incorporate uh, this skill development into their practices and, and more so even at the youngest levels? 
Yeah, um, great question, Matt. And I think it's one of those, uh, we can always get better, right? And over the last year, the the ADM and the CEP have worked pretty closely uh, together. And I'm on the curriculum committee. And as we continue to roll out our new curriculum, we've made sure that we have these progressive conversations starting with our level one coaches. So we wanna make sure that our coaches, they understand that importance of beginning at the youngest ages for kids to build that body confidence and that contact confidence. And so we're really trying to, to preach this message home. Um, I think that we also have our, our new online modules that uh, will have specific examples and activities for coaches to complete while establishing those touch points with the curriculum, the content actually throughout the year. And so, I know that last month we just released a pilot program that was picked up and will start to be rolled out this year that culminates with a reflection guide um, that coaches will receive at the end of their clinics. And so this guide is sort of to help them take the content that they're learning in our clinics and continue to help them reflect on ways to better integrate it into their practices. Because at the end of the day, you know, we are trying to get better and uh, you know, a major component of that reflection guide is, is competitive contact and body checking. And so um, I think that the new curriculum itself is really designed to be interactive. And as we continue to revamp how the CEP is delivered to our coaches, we want to just make sure that's not this one and done situation, right? Um, we want to make sure that, you know, coaches understand, that we understand that they, they need that high quality information in the clinics, but just like our players, the real learning happens after the clinic. And so we wanna make sure that we have those, those resources and those touch points with the, the curriculum content between levels one and two and two and three and three and four. So as they progress through all four levels of coaching, um, we wanna make sure that they continue to have those touch points with uh, the content throughout the year. Yeah, and no, if I remember correctly too, Heather, there, there's even some off-ice components uh, that, uh, that are developed to, to help kids make that progression or to help them uh, go through that process of body con or competitive contact into the body checking and stuff like that. Is that still, uh, is that still part of the, the CEP program? Yep, absolutely. So we have those coaching resources that are on our, our coaching website. Um, they, we have them, we normally in person clinics, we would actually give them physical uh, books and, and office cards and things like that. Um, right now, since everything is virtual, we try to, to pivot as much as we could and put almost all of our resources online for, for our coaches to have access to. Okay, great. That's uh, some great information there. Um, Roger, going to have you, we're going to show a couple of video clips here. And the first one um, deals with really uh, competitive contact and, and what we're striving for really at all levels of play. So um, as I play it through this and I'll do, I'll play it a couple of times. Uh, could you maybe walk us through there, uh, walk us through this video a little bit, maybe watch it the first time um, and tell us what's good about the play. Uh, and, and really, is there any reason as to why this isn't a, a, a doable level of, of competitive contact at all levels uh, of USA hockey? Okay, I'll play it. Uh, play it again, Roger. If you want to walk us through, yeah, I think the key is is players being under control, players taking good angles, sticks on the ice. There's an attempt to play the puck. There's no intent to overpower physically the opponent. It's it's everything is is, is controlled um, physicality. And and I think to be honest with you, Matt, like we when we when we go to watch games that that, that are below the checking level, we would almost like to see more competitive contact. There almost yeah. isn't enough. Uh, Cause using your body to win possess position, to win space, to win the puck, that's a big part of the game. Your stick and your body is a huge part of playing off the puck and winning possession. And a lot of our coaches just aren't comfortable teaching it. And so we're really making a strong push as Heather talked about with the, the CEP and our curriculum to get coaches to kind of buy into that progression. You know, we kind of talk about it like it's it's like um, getting a learner's permit with a car. Like we don't just say, go go drive a car. There's a whole process to 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 getting your license. And 
And there's a couple of years that go along with that. And we want our coaches to, to encourage this type of play, taking away the hands, winning space, you know, encouraging some, some contact to win pos position and to win the puck. It's all part of the game and, and should be taught and, and, and be uh, encouraged uh, consistently, not only in practice, but certainly in games as well. Very good. Very good. Uh, obviously, another a new definition that's going to go into the rule book uh, as a result, which is part of this progression, um, is angling. Um, and that's a good legal defensive skill used to direct control the puck carrier uh, to an area that closes the gap and or creates an opening that is too small for the puck carrier to advance. Um, Heather, could you maybe walk us through this uh, next example? Uh, because it is such a fundamental defensive skill um, where the focus is on establishing body position to win possession of the puck. Um, walk us through uh, this next example in terms of what you see, what you like about it, and, and if there is anything that you might want to change. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if we can play it again. Yeah, I'm going to go back here just a second. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the white player here does a really great job of steering blue into, into a space that he wants them to. So obviously it's towards the boards. Um, I think he does a really good job of closing the gap and uh, pinching off the player and giving him really nowhere to go. Um, what we are preaching in our coaching clinics right now is what, and what I would like to see this player do a little bit better is I would, I would like to see a little bit better stick play, right? So when he comes in for contact, you notice that his stick is up by his waist. And so one of the things that we really sort of preach in our, in our uh, clinics is we want that stick on puck. So we want him going in with the stick on the ice and, and trying to win possession of the puck. And so I think that if he has his stick on, on the ice and he gets stick on puck, what that does is that creates an opportunity for a turnover in the offensive zone, potentially catching the D um, off guard. He's still, you know, and the, the competitive contact is the exact same if his, if his, uh, stick is on the ice or if he goes in the way that he does like the outcome is the, still the same but what isn't the same is the fact that the turnover now leads to a neutral zone regroup where the, the defense it looks like just flips it back into the the offensive zone so by having that that stick on the ice and going stick on puck we're trying to really kind of preach that to coaches that you know we're looking to regain that possession and try to create that quick turnover and, uh, and really, I mean, it's just, it comes back to, to puck control and, and that possession game. So that's what I would like to see changed. Matt, okay, like to very good. To that too is, and I think Heather Absolutely. Point with the stick, um, cause that's a huge part of that. Cause you can see he also flashes his elbow a little bit there cause the stick is up. But the other thing is as a coach and as a, you know, an official, his feet are going the same direction as the opponent. And, and when your feet are going the same direction as the opponent, you have a much better job, do a much better job of a good angle, taking away space properly. If his feet are going towards the boards, there's going to be a check. If his feet are going the same direction as the opponent or the puck carrier, then it's a much more uh, safer, safer for both the checker and the, the, the person receiving the, 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 the bump or the contact and also more productive and less, less likely to take a penalty. Very good. Excellent, uh, excellent points, uh, uh, both of you. Uh, the next part, and, and I just want to show a real quick example, uh, collisions are still going to happen. Look, it's a fast sport. Uh, players are moving. Uh, you may have two players that are clearly still going in the direction uh, and trying to win possession of the puck. Their sticks are on the ice, but they still – uh, end up uh, running into each other and, 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 and stuff like that. So uh, a collision is, is another definition uh, that you can see there. And, and uh, just to run a real quick video example um, from a, a women's game a long, long time ago, you'll notice the white player turns her back uh, really uh, kind of sort of uh, um, is in the process of playing the puck. The red player doesn't step up. Her stick, her stick is on the ice. Her stick is effort. The effort there, the intent is to play the puck. 
and uh, the white player just ends up uh, kind of sort of skating into her and, and falling down. Um, so definitely uh, um, that would be considered a collision and uh, would be something that uh, would not fit under the penalty criteria to be called there. Um, the last one and, and the last example is, is uh, we've talked about or, or we really want to emphasize physical engagement. And that's when players are um, competing for the puck. Uh, generally, it's going to be along the boards. It may be in front of the net, but the focus is, is clearly on uh, pursuing the puck and, and gaining possession of the puck uh, or winning possession of the puck, in, in which case there will be a, a certain level of, of allowable contact. Um, so a, one example here, uh, Raj, if you want to maybe walk us through this one a little bit. Um, and, and tell us what you like about this example. Yeah, it's a it's a big part of the game right now, um, Matt. And I think it's something that we we would like to see our coaches encourage at, at a younger age than it's actually happening. We almost call it like that pre-bump when there's two players trying to win space or trying to get to the puck. And and you use your shoulder, you use the outside of your hip, you might use the outside of your knee. Um, you know, your arm possibly a little bit if you don't flash the elbow, if the stick's on the ice, just to kind of get a little bit of a bump or a, a, a little bit of an edge on the opponent to win, win the race to the puck. Uh, I think it's, it's, it can't be done too aggressively, um, and you got to be so smart when you're getting near the boards and, and to protect both players from not losing an edge and going in dangerously at full speed. But that pre-bump, Right there, you can see it. Both players trying to get a physical edge is a big part of the game at the next level. And I think we've got to encourage some of that at our younger ages so that they understand how to win space, not just with their feet, not with just with their superior speed, but by using their bodies as well. Really important part of the game. Yep, and the best part about it is uh, Team USA gains possession out of that deal too, right? Yep, yeah. Trying to get that step in front and use your, your shoulder, your outside of your hip, your outside of your arm, outside of your knee to kind of win that position is, is really a, a big part of the game. All over the ice, it, it happens everywhere. The best players, the best, the best checkers at the highest level, they're not hitters, they're checkers. They're like the Bergerons and the Dad Zooks when he was playing uh, they don't overwhelm people physically, but they're just really good at using their body to, to kind of bump them off a little bit to win that extra space. Okay. Um, so uh, again, the, the final slide, I just want to share with everyone tonight. Uh, that's what's going to go into uh, uh, the rule. Um, basically rule 604 is going to be changed from body checking, uh, to, uh, basically body contact and non or non-checking classifications to uh, body checking competitive contact um, and uh, really want to emphasize and, and I'll let you guys both you Heather and Roger maybe comment on this again um, just how strongly USA Hockey feels um, and wants to encourage that competitive contact at all levels of classifications including you know even the eight and under there there's some progression that's starting there um, so um, and really emphasizing the fact that that competitive contact does not mean no contact at all. Um, so any uh, kind of sort of final thoughts or, or anything you want to share to emphasize those points either? No, I, I, yeah, I think that uh, it's it's incredibly important. It's uh, like you've mentioned, Matt, it's the, the progression that, that helps kids uh, become comfortable with it and building that contact confidence. Um, on, on the ice and off the ice. Um, off the ice helps with on ice, especially when the skills uh, to, to be able to stand on your skates is difficult uh, as it is for, for the littles. Um, so I think it's, it's incredibly important. I think there also is a, is a parent education aspect to it as well. Uh, I think that makes, when, when all three, you know, when you think of all of the adult influences on the game, you know, the, the, the major ones are, are the coaches, the, the parents, the refs, and, and the associations, right? 
Um, I think having the more that all of those, the adult influencers are on the same page, the better the experience is for the kids. And so I think that education's at, at the core of that um, and then creating that environment uh, on the ice, off the ice, within the associations and, and within USA Hockey as an organization, I think is uh, incredibly important. Yeah, I, th I think okay. the mistake that's made, Matt, is that our coaches sometimes won't encourage some of the the contact because they're afraid a kid might take a penalty, especially maybe a kid who's a little bit physically stronger or a little bit bigger at that certain stage in their life. Um, but we we were, we're trying to get our coaches to constantly send the first day they step on the ice, competitive body contact all the time in every practice and everything you do, encourage it in games. And if, if they happen to overwhelm and take a penalty, then they, they overwhelm and take a penalty. But um, it's an important part of the game, and, and it needs to be encouraged and taught and um, embraced. Okay, thank you. That, uh, that concludes the presentation part. We're going to get into some more questions here. And, and just a reminder uh, from our audience that if you do have any questions, I know we have one or two in the queue that we will eventually get to here. Um, but if you do have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function and uh, we'll do the best we can to uh, get them all answered tonight. Um, Heather, I want to turn back to you for, for a second here. Um, basically, um, as indicated, you know, you have an extensive background in exercise science um, and age appropriate physical literacy. And that's a big part of what our ADM is all about. Uh, so from your experience, um, and what you've done in creating evidence-based program guidelines for younger athletes. Um, where does competitive contact fit into the long-term athlete development uh, model? And how is USA Hockey leading uh, the other NGBs in this area? Yeah, um, I, I kind of touched on it a little bit when I started talking about that, that contact confidence. And, and especially at the younger ages, we can do that in a fun and safe way then it's, I think that's really the most impactful uh, way that we can not only just engage kids, um, but also just make it as, as, as fun and, and engaging as possible. Um, but so for instance, with the, the little kids, right? We kind of teach kids that, you know, pushing and shoving in normal life is not the most acceptable behavior, but in, in any invasion sport, uh, engaging physically is really one of the most fun aspects of playing when, when they know how to do it. And so it takes a little bit of time for kids to become comfortable uh, with, you know, with, with that contact. And you know, the way that we typically socialize girls, it may take them a little bit longer to, to become comfortable with that content. That's a whole other topic, but it really kind of touches on that, that physical literacy aspect. And so the better movers we have when our, with, in our little kids, the, the, more, um, the more skilled athletes they can become. Right, and so little things like playing bumper butts uh, when they're when they're younger, throwing a couple of ringettes on the ice really forces that that competitive contact at the younger ages. Um, but again, it's in that fun, engaging, and safe way. And and so I think that USA Hockey continues to lead the way, not only with the the declaration of player safety and trying to change the culture around the sport, but also the I think the the emphasis that we place with the ADM on on science and evidence based practices. Um, physical literacy is, is one of those concepts where if we can build, you know, when we have kids that are competent movers, right, so they're really good at moving, not just on the ice, this is off ice skills, so multi-sport participation helps with that, um, but they, they have the ability to move on and off the ice really, really well. That gives them more confidence. It gives them more confidence going into the corners. It gives them more confidence bumping into each other on the ice. And when they have that, that confidence level, it really it starts to impact their motivation, right? So it kind of comes this, this positive feedback loop. But what we have to really be careful with, and, and one of the things that we talk extensively with our coaches, is that with that positive feedback loop, if at any point the, um, the, the, the that loop is, is negatively impact, it can very easily become a negative impact loop, right? So if we don't build these really good movers at, at the young ages, then they're not gonna have that confidence to go into the boards. They're not gonna have that confidence to bump into another player um, knowing that it's not going to hurt or that they're gonna be able to take that impact and remain on their feet. When they lose that confidence, then they lose the motivation. And then all of a sudden now we're, we're starting to see dropout. 
So having this, the science and evidence-based practices to kind of guide our, our American development model and that foundation for, for youth development, I think really kind of sets USA Hockey apart and has for, you know, since, since we implemented the, the ADM, I think, what, 11 or 12 years ago. So we continue to keep pushing the envelope on, uh, on making it better I mean, every day, just trying to, to do what we can to, to keep making ourselves better. So hopefully that'll translate down to the coaches and, and the kids as well. That's some great information there. And, and uh, uh, Raj, a little bit of a follow-up there is, is I think you have some experience in terms of understanding what are the European countries doing, you know, when it comes to the body contact and body checking and when do they start and, and how far off are, are we really off from uh, the top European countries? Some of them are, some of them have, have, have gone back to, um, you know, body checking at a younger age than what we have. Um, and some of them are kind of all over the map um, in terms of when they allow the full body contact. I think the difference there, though, is that there's smaller countries and their, their, their federations able to have a little bit more of an impact and control over what happens on a daily basis at the, at the rink. I think when, you, when you're talking about the components of body checking, you know, we ask our, our, our coaches to do a lot. Um, you know, there's so many different components in the game. And I, like I said earlier, I think one of the areas that they're least confident from a coaching standpoint in teaching is the body checking piece. Um, and so that's why these discussions, uh, getting as much information, the education process, the coaching clinics, the, the, the cohesiveness between the officiating group, the CEP group, and the ADM group and the messaging that's going out, all that stuff is really, really critical so that we have a, uh, a safer cleaner, more productive uh, product out there on the ice. Um, I think the one area where the, the Europeans are, are, are a tad bit ahead of us is just because they, they play smaller area hockey till a much later age. And in some places it's 11 or 12 years old, they're still playing either a half ice or a cross ice format. So they're, they're almost encouraging more natural contact with less speed generated. So it's a safer, less impactful collision for a kid um, than it would be in the full ice game uh, for us over here. So it's, it's a, the, the, the format allows them to introduce some of those components more naturally than it does for us. Um, beyond all the other positives of that format from a player development standpoint. Yeah, understood. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that's some very good information and, and very well stated in terms of um, some of the challenges of size of our organization and stuff like that in comparison to um, some of the European countries and, and what they're capable of doing. Uh, quick question from the audience here. Um, I'm going to steer towards Heather. Um, how do we differentiate between a defensive player angling to gain better position on a player carrying the puck along the boards and a defensive player pinching a puck carrier along the boards. Um, they both tend to impede momentum. And a lot of times the coaches are screaming, you know, that that's a, that that's a pinch and, and that's a, that's an interference. There should be an interference. How do you, uh, how do you feel we can best differentiate between those two? I think that, I mean, anytime there is that, that overt, you know, forearm pushing off, then, then we're getting into a body check and not necessarily angling. Um, I don't think, like Roger said, I mean, when you're, if you can position yourself so that your feet are facing the same direction as the other players, but less likely, and you have that stick on puck, less likely you're going to get a call on, on that kind of a play. Um, I leave the interpretation of the rules up to the professionals. Uh, but as a coach, that's what, that's what I, that's, that's what we're talking about with our coaches is you want to try to take away that space and do it properly. So you're, you know, you're going in, you're steering them into into a position that they don't have any other place to go, um, whether that's on the boards or whether that's towards uh, towards your own team. You know, you're pushing them into a certain place on the ice. Um, that's what we're preaching when it comes to to angling. And you know, I think that just making sure that you you're doing everything that you you can correctly, um, it's going to go either way. And like you said, 50% of the people are going to uh, likely be upset with either the call or the no call. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Raj. But. No, I think you stated it really well. And I think it's, it's, it's 
where's the eyes and the head of the checker? What are they looking at? Are they making an attempt on the puck? Or are they just going in to play the body? A lot of the reaction by the parents and the coaches is, is the end result. Like did one person fall down? Um, did one person overwhelm the other? Um, what's the size differential? There's, there's so much emphasis on the end result rather than the, the steps to the contact uh, happening. And, and, you know, like Heather said, she's de it's dead on right. The, where are the feet pointed? Where's the stick? And where's the head? Yeah, I think it's fair to say, and you would both agree that whether it's body checking or whether it's competitive contact, the, the focus in this day and age has to be on winning possession of the puck, correct? Agreed? Yep. Priority number one. Okay, fantastic. And that, that kind of leads me into my next question then, Raj. Other than that focus, um, you know, you played college hockey in the 80s. Um, you then coached in the, the 90s and the, the early 2000s before coming on with USA Hockey uh, and the ADM program in 2009. How has that game changed, you know, pertaining to the culture of body checking and competitive contact during that time? And, is, and quite frankly, is the game better today than it was when you played? Oh yeah, I think it's much better. Much, I mean, it's um, there's much more emphasis on 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 making a play, on possessing the puck. There's way less uh, intimidation type play. Um, you know, the 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 better the, the coaches that do a really good job are not encouraging kids to finish their checks. They're encouraging them to get into the play, outnumber the opponent. I mean, all that kind of stuff is is has completely changed being under control, the safety factor uh, along the boards, um, the, 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 uh, you know, the, the, the encouragement of, of players to keep their head up, um, the encouragement of stick on puck. Um, you know, a lot of us, it was jam the stick between the legs and pin them up against the boards and try to do some damage when you're there. Uh, the, 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 the strong emphasis of, you know, the, taking away the hits to the head, the the hits from behind, you know, the emphasis that USA Hockey and, and certainly when I was in college hockey every year of getting rid of the stick work. I mean, there's just so many things that have been cleaned up. I mean, you go back and look at games back in the 80s and 90s, and it's it's almost frightening to watch. It's, it's almost criminal, some of the stuff that took place. Um, and especially with the stick, uh, it's it's just it's uh, it's a much more enjoyable game, in my opinion. Okay. Um, Heather, as I mentioned, again, you did some extensive research on um, what makes sports fun for children, um, which is such a fascinating topic. And I think um, is probably the primary reason as to why, you know, we have 37 people joining us tonight uh, is because they, they love the sport of hockey and, and have a passion for it and ultimately want to create that environment and that culture where they're having fun. Um, where does, where does it fit in? What have you found or, or what have you discovered in your research as it relates to hockey? Where does competitive contact or the, the body checking part of it fit into the fun component? And what are some of the areas that, that, really, um, that we really are, are going to start highlighting as a result of some of that research in terms of creating that environment? Yeah, it's I, I love this topic. I'm just a little bit passionate about it. Um, but one of the things that that kids love, kids love to compete, right? They love to do things that are that are fun and engaging. And so what we try to to tell our coaches is anytime that we can create a game out of a situation or anytime we're trying to teach a habit or a, a concept or a tactic, how do we do it in the most in, in a game like manner um, so that the skill is transferable to the actual game but also kids have more fun when they're playing games and so um, the you know the number one reason or the number one determinant uh, that kids say is like the most important thing to, that they can do to have fun is trying your best and working hard and what we know is is you know anytime that we can make a game out of something they automatically start trying harder they automatically start working harder and they're automatically starting to have more fun. And with that, and oftentimes, anytime you're, you set up a game in a game-like environment, you're creating that competitive, that competition and that body contact. 
So playing hard is one of those fun determinants, that playing rough, that kind of getting into, into the nitty gritty, of, into the corners on the field, that any kind of invasion sport, like I mentioned earlier, that's that physical engagement is one of the most fun parts of, of playing the sport. But with that, it kind of, it, it all circles back to that physical literacy aspect of it is if kids aren't confident in their, their movement abilities and their ability to engage in that contact and maintain control of their own body in the process, it becomes a little bit scary. It becomes not as fun, right? And so it's all about for us, I think, really driving home, how do we teach body contact and competitive contact and body checking as a skill? It's a, it is a progressive skill that needs to be taught and how, and that, that falls on us as coaches and as adults to really kind of hone in on, on what are all of those little intricacies and those technical abilities that kids need to be able to have to be able to execute this skill properly. So I think that, you know, when it comes to making sure that, you know, the, the sport is fun, competitive contact absolutely plays a role in it. And I think that through games, you kind of facilitate that natural contact um, between players and, and within players in those situations. Um, as for, for other, and I'll do just a little shout out here, but one of the fun determinants uh, for the referees on the call, the kids identified uh, referees that make, um, let's see, a ref that who makes consistent calls. So if you want to impact the, uh, the fun experience for the kids on the ice, keep those calls consistent. <laughs> Okay, excellent. And I think, uh, I think that that's a very good message for our officiating side as well, is not only to uh, um, basically be consistent in terms of enforcing the rules, but enforce the rules to the best of their ability. And don't put yourself in a situation where you're picking and choosing uh, which rules you want to enforce on any given night uh, and or based on the time of the game or the score of the game and those types of things. Um, Roger, I want to turn back to you real quickly because uh, I know that we both and, and actually all three of us saw an article last week, but um, I know Roger, you commented on it that it was you found it to be really interesting. Um, but uh, the athletic director of the Ohio State University, which I think arguably is a top three, top five football school um, that focuses on football, um, the athletic director now uh, has gone on record publicly stating that he feels that uh, tackle football should be banned for any players under the age of 13 and that uh, those kids can develop their skills, um, the, the proper football skills that they need playing flag football at those younger levels. Um, I, I think your response was interesting and, and that certainly was mine as well. Um, what are your thoughts when you read that? And, and I guess in your mind, does it validate what USA Hockey uh, has been leading the way on for many years? Yeah, it does, Matt. I, I think that's a great, great uh, comment and, and, and interesting discussion because I, I think it's interesting because when we when we decided to to really push hard to move body checking up an age group, um, I don't know what how many years ago that is that five six years ago, Matt. Now, I mean, it seems like just yesterday. Um, you know, a big part of that that initial push was nothing to really do with safety. Um, it had to do with player development because when we saw um, full body checking at, at 12 and under, um, we saw a lot of kids not wanting to play with the puck. Kids that, would, that, that wouldn't go get the puck and then kids, because they were, they were a little nervous to go in the corner first, or kids that would pull up, not go in first to win it because they wanted to show how tough they were and check the kid instead. And so we, we looked at it from a player development standpoint saying, you know what, we can always teach the physical component of, of checking. If we do a good job of this and we had that progression and that competitive body contact, but boy, if we don't allow our younger players to make plays and feel confident with the puck and give them a little time and space and, and encourage um, making plays and not trying to win games through intimidation and physical play, um, we're going to probably have a bigger pool of better players and we're going to have a better chance of winning more gold medals and putting more kids up at the higher levels, whether it's in high school hockey, junior hockey, college hockey, or the NHL or in the women's national program. And then the concussion situation hit, 
it just exploded in the NFL. And so it was almost the perfect storm of us attacking it from a player development standpoint, but then the safety standpoint kicked in as well. And, and the information that we got about the damage that a concussion does to a young child's brain and the long-term impl implications of that. And so it really became incumbent upon us. And part of the reason why we're having this discussion with all of you tonight is to really understand that our game has a physical component to it. It's gotta be controlled. It's gotta be taught. It's gotta be coached. It's gotta be encouraged, but it's gotta be safe and it's gotta be smart. And the puck is the priority, not the body, not, not intimidating, not trying to hurt, not trying to hit. When I played, it was called checking. And somehow through the 80s and 90s, it became hitting. And it, our game is a, is a physical game, but it's got to be a controlled, smart, uh, uh, physical game. And, and it got away from us, and we're reeling it back in, and, and we're going to make it better. Very good. Heather, I know you saw the article, too. Any thoughts on yours on your end? No, I think that it, Roger kind of touched on, on most of, of my thoughts. Uh, I think that, you know, when it comes to growing the game, right, we want to make, we want this to be, I still play hockey. I, I love hockey and I was a physical player when I, when I played. Um, but I think that, you know, at the end of the day, if there are, there are people that think that or the, the evidence is starting to show us, the, like Roger said, the impact of those concussions that the kids have. And it's a lot of it is just because they haven't developed the skill set to be able to execute that, that technique and that technical, it's a very technical skill that body checking, you know, is. And if we don't, if we haven't done our jobs um, or if the kids just haven't, they aren't developmentally prepared enough to be able to execute that skill, then it's our fault for putting them in a situation that we're really kind of setting them up to fail um, and, and to fail in a way that's going to impact the rest of their lives. So I love this game. I love hockey so much. Um, but I mean, I would like to have, you know, something other than scrambled eggs for brains when I'm, you know, Roger's age. <laughs> a long ways away, Heather. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and you, you talked about growing the game and, and that actually is, a, again, another perfect segue. Um, but uh, word on the street is that the IHF is considering um, adding all forms uh, or most forms of body checking, uh, except for a uh, head on, uh, so to speak, or, or at a, a direct angle um, to the women's game. Um, as someone extremely involved in developing and growing the girls game, uh, what's your initial reaction to that? And, and what type of impact do you feel that that type of decision uh, may have on your efforts and, and ultimately our ability to, to grow the girls game? Yeah, I mean, like we've kind of drilled home, you know, body checking is a skill, right? And I've heard it was mentioned that it may be considered an equalizer with teams playing against US or Canada. Um, unfortunately, I'm not entirely convinced that that's going to be the case. I, uh, you know, when we, we already have a situation where there's a skill gap involved, um, and then you add a very technical skill into the mix, I think that the more skilled teams are going to be able to execute it more effectively than less skilled teams. Um, and so, you know, with the, the men's game, like Roger mentioned, you know, is changing with the, you know, to be less focused on, on body checking and more about stick on puck and getting the puck back. Body checking, I think, is going to fundamentally change the game. Um, I think that without it, our game is, is faster and it promotes a more skilled, uh, more skilled game where, you know, size isn't a limiting factor. And so when we talk about, you know, the growth of the game, um, you know, you look at the, the Johnny Goudreau's or the Kendall Coins or the Emily Falsers, right? They're some of the most skilled players that are playing the game right now, um, but in a game that emphasizes big hits over puck possession, they don't make it to the highest levels despite being as skilled as they are. I'm not saying that they don't, but there's a lot of people, there's a lot of players that, you know, that may not make it to the highest levels, even though they can arguably be considered some of the most skilled players. And so if we're trying to continue to better our game and grow our game without knowing the, the whole picture on, uh, on, on first glance, not necessarily in support of, of that decision. Yeah, Roger, any comments uh, on your end on that? Yeah, once you put seatbelts in a car, I don't think you should take them out. Okay, very well stated. Um, 
one more quick question from the audience here. Um, and again, I think this is coming from uh, the coaching side, but when can we expect uh, to see some additional resources on the USA hockey website to assist with age appropriate on ice instruction? Um, so I think uh, this is your opportunity to plug here, Roger, maybe the ADM and, and um, that particular page and, and what type of resources you have available. Yeah, I think if you go to it, we're, we're actually doing some pretty cool stuff right now and we're going to continue to do it moving forward. If you go to USA Hockey uh, on YouTube and look at coaches clips, there's actually a bunch recently that have been put up about stick on puck and using your body, just like we talked about tonight. There's a lot of information. We have a lot of information out there. I just don't know if people know about it. You, uh, YouTube, uh, usahockey.com, admkids.com. There is a ton of information uh, that we have. In fact, to be honest with you, a lot of the European countries use our materials, uh, especially in this, this conversation we're having today in terms of uh, body checking and, and, and angling and, and stick on puck and stuff like that. So, um, and, and certainly I would strongly encourage anybody that's on the call to reach out to any one of us regional managers, and we can also get you additional information one of the things we're trying to do is to get coaches to, in, in, in every practice they do, is have some aspect of body contact, body checking in, in practice. We would even say at the, at the 12 and under, where there's no checking in games, we're actually asking our coaches, kind of like the probationary period of driver's ed, like I mentioned before, to encourage full body checking in practice, just so that the kids get a feel for what that's going to feel like, what that's like. And they're doing it against their friends and their teammates and not the, the town over, whereas the intensity's up and the fans are going crazy and the parents are nuts and all that other stuff. So um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a missing piece for us right now, but we're making really strong, strong, strong efforts to make it a bigger deal than it has been uh, as we move forward here. And okay, thanks, Raj. Matthew, yeah. go ahead. To, to add one thing, because uh, Roger brought up a really great point about um, implementing that full body checking in, in, in practice um, at the younger ages. I want to make sure that coaches understand as well that girls that even even playing on an all girls team need to go through the exact same progression as, as boys. Right. And so if you think about, you know, because a body check is going to happen in the girls game, even though it's not allowed, hooking's not allowed, tripping's not allowed. Right. All of those things still happen. And so we need to make sure that we're preparing our girls and training our girls the same way that we're training our boys, because at the end of the day, it's that unexpected, you know, that unexpected, unexpected body check that causes a lot of the concussions in female hockey. And so it really is from a safety component, it's having that understanding of being able to control your body going into a situation where you know that there's about to be body contact. So that progression has to be, that has to happen in girls teams the same way that it happens in boys teams. Just wanted to make sure that, that was- And Matt, good. if you don't mind, just a, a really quick story um, that's really pertinent to this and to what Heather just said, and we talked about the feet and, and a lot of the, some of the serious injuries are, are not necessarily the kids getting checked. It's the kids giving the checks because they go in straight in. They don't take an angle. Their feet aren't going up or down the boards. They're going at the boards. Their toes are pointed at the boards. And, I, and, and this is a really important aspect for me because my phone rang at, at um, 12, 12 a.m. October 21st, 1995. And one of my former players, um, one of my former students, high school students and high school players who almost came to play for me in college, but decided to go to BU instead, uh, broke his neck, Travis Roy in his first shift. And Travis was going straight into the corner, feet not parallel, going north or south, going east, west, and, and hurt himself badly. And we just lost Travis this year. We don't want that to happen to anybody. So it's not, the misconception sometimes is the kid getting checked. It's the person giving the check as well, being under control, understanding your environment, understanding where the boards are, where the opponents are, having that awareness. And so to add that component of checking and, and contact and practice just prepares the kid that much better for real games where that stuff's going to happen. And, and we've got to take it seriously and we've got to implement it and, and um, we got to get people to buy in. Thanks Roger. Some uh, excellent information there. And, and, uh, uh, we're approaching the top of the hour here, so 
I have to uh, fulfill my responsibility, uh, I think, with uh, BJ and uh, uh, selling, the, selling the program a little bit and the future program. So I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, just to go over real quickly the upcoming schedule. Uh, tonight, as you know, we, we just had a really interesting session on competitive contact. Uh, next week, Scott Zelkin will be back as your host and moderator to talk about uh, um, the junior officiating development program a little bit and some of the other opportunities that are out there for uh, some of our younger officials. On Tuesday, April 20th, BJ will be back with the uh, uh, ever popular You Make the Call Live uh, session while he'll have some uh, video clips prepared and, and ready to uh, uh, discuss some, some, some live action and, and what the correct calls are. Uh, and then we're going to actually go into a little bit of a summer break here. Um, when we first started this Zoomcast uh, process, uh, I don't think we imagined we'd go 42 episodes uh, before, uh, um, before taking a break. And, and it's been uh, extremely popular, extremely successful. And uh, we're looking forward to coming back again in the fall and uh, really putting on uh, another uh, great, uh, a great schedule of, of some programs and some conversations and, and information that'll make everything a little bit better. Uh, just a reminder, I got to uh, also uh, push up our social media, follow us on usahockey.com uh, on the YouTube channel, as, as Roger indicated, uh, all of uh, the, the 41 or, or, or Zoom cast are also can be viewed on demand uh, on that YouTube channel, along with a bunch of coaching information, ADM information and everything else. And uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter and, and Instagram and the other uh, social media uh, outlets. Uh, reminder, BJ should be sending out a uh, survey for your feedback to all the participants shortly. And we appreciate it. Uh, appreciate that information and uh, that feedback as we move forward. Uh, I want to thank our participants for joining us. I know that we have a group of regulars that are on. Uh, thank you very much for being a part of uh, our program and your continued passion for hockey. Um, and want to especially thank uh, Roger and, and Heather tonight and, and uh, give uh, you each a chance to, to kind of sort of share your final words of wisdom, uh, so to speak, with our audience and uh, I'll let you guys get going on and join the rest of your evening as well. So, um, Heather, we'll start with you. Oh, thanks, Matt. I just really appreciate uh, you having us on and i um, very happy to be a part of this. And like Roger said, anything that um, that we can do to, to help out, feel free to contact us and we're here as a resource for you all. Okay, Raj. I'd first like to apologize to all the officials I've probably verbally abused over the years. <laughs> I'm coming clean. Um, but but most importantly, I think the the I think the, for people out there to realize the 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 relationship that that uh, our group has with with Matt, with your group, and 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 with yourself and BJ and Scotty Zelkin and the referee um, group, and and how we're trying to attack this from both angles, I think is really going to have a positive out, uh, um, output for for everybody involved, uh, and particularly the players. Uh, I think it's gonna it's gonna be real positive, and it's been a lot of fun. So thank you for having us. Thank you. And, and again, Heather and, and Roger, thank you very much uh, for your uh, time tonight uh, and your expertise sharing, uh, sharing your passion. And I think that that's the one thing that uh, uh, that becomes very clear to all of us uh, when we have our weekly meetings and, and when we do uh, some cross things, uh, cross program things like this is, is we all have the same passion for the game and the love for the game. And, and uh, that's certainly true with our audience as well. So Again, thanks for everyone for your continued dedication and involvement with USA Hockey. Uh, we appreciate uh, everything that you do for us and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. We'll uh, sign off and, uh, and uh, good luck.